Okay, the uh, last speaker of the day is, is uh, very, uh, very good. He's f another friend of mine, and uh, he and I met about five years ago, I think. So I guess there is something to long-term friendships. But he's uh, the uh, owner of your energy systems. He's associated with uh, this conference as, as one of the sponsors. And um, he's extremely knowledgeable about mycotoxins and glutathione. So he's going to speak today on mycotoxins and depletion of glutathione, Dr. Tim Guilford. Thank you, Dennis. I want to thank everyone for joining us at the conference. And I also want to tell you how proud I am to be part of this extraordinary lineup of presenters. Um, I got interested in glutathione um, in the mid-90s. I was interested in mercury at that time and went to the library to read why mercury was toxic. And the first paper I found showed that it depleted glutathione. In the early 80s, uh, I ran an allergy immunology lab and that specialized also in not only allergy but also viral immunology. And um, so when I read that glutathione both detoxifies metals but also controls immune function, which I'll show you in just a minute, it really hit me. It's like two, my two worlds were colliding. I've been following molds for quite a while. I presented a paper, a presentation at one of Bill Ray's environmental medicine meetings in about 1984, in which we looked at the immunologic responses to Canada albicans. So it uh, takes a while sometimes for some of these concepts to become accepted. And I think that the work you're seeing here today is going to facilitate that progression a great deal. The name of the company is Your Energy Systems because it was intended to identify materials that will help support mitochondrial function. I'm convinced that uh, your energy system is the critical factor in our health. And uh, it's very interesting to see the data that was presented by Dr. Brewer, not only on mycotoxins, but also on mitochondrial function. Um, if you need any of the papers I'm going to show you, um, just uh, drop me a note, and I'll show you where you can find some more information on those. And don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions. DrGilford.com has a list of the, uh, my publications, but also, I don't know, is this do red or is green? But I don't know what green means. There you go. Uh, my publications and um, res the research, if you go to this and forward slash research, it's research on the liposomal glutathione that I've been working with for the past nine years. And we now have six studies in that area. And if you uh, look at those, um, titles and their abstracts, it's linked to their abstracts. If you let me know, I'll be happy to make sure you can get the whole article. So the pathogenicity of mycotoxins was originally described related to aflatoxin B1 toxicity, and it generated intracellular reactive oxygen species. These are free radicals. Uh, for example, the superoxide ion, hydroxyl radical, sometimes I call that O, that's kind of a hit. Hydrogen peroxide, which uh, they count as a free radical, but it, because it turns into these hydroxyl radicals so easily. Uh, it, during the metabolic processing of aflatoxin B1 to the epoxides. So the conjecture that mycotoxins are related to antioxidant function and depletion of your protection has been at present for quite a while. Now, in regards to glutathione, it's both an antioxidant, a detoxifier, and it turns out to be an immune modulator. And I'm going to, I'm toying with the concept of presenting this information, and I'll support that as, the, as we progress through the presentation, as a glutathione-related immune deficiency or glutathione-related inflammatory disease that can be either systemic or local. For example, in the lung, you can have a deficiency of glutathione even when it's normal in the blood. We see this a lot in people with Parkinson's disease. They're low in specific cells in their brain called substantia nigra. They're low in glutathione as the first uh, indicator of progression of disease, uh, and yet their blood may have adequate glutathione. So that's a concept that I think we need to be comfortable with, that it can be deficient in a specific tissue. We're going to talk about macrophage function, ironically, and thank you, Dr. Holland, for the introduction. Um, 
that's compromised by low glutathione. Turns out our macrophages are the first line of defense. Uh, they do both uh, ingestion, phagocytosis, cytokine production, and then pathogen killing. And the information I'm going to show you is, um, as we progress is uh, first of uh, several articles related to the cells associate, associated with the innate immune system, specifically macrophages, antigen-presenting cells, and then uh, polymorphonuclear nuclear cells, which PMNs, which is, I've seen the data, but the paper is uh, in progress on the latter. So oxidation stress um, uh, can cause damage, as you've heard previously, to DNA and proteins and lipids, especially the lipid membranes, but this includes not only the outside, but also in the inside of um, our cells, such as the mitochondria. And um, measurements of oxidative stress are usually related to, in the science papers, to the amount of reduced glutathione, abbreviated GSH, versus oxidized glutathione. And um, what glutathione can do, either directly or in combination with some enzymes, is inhibit peroxidation scavenge these C radicals and protect the cell membranes. There's some enzymes that glutathione works with. Uh, the peroxidase, I'll show you, and as uh, Eileen Wright mentioned earlier to me that uh, she's seen data on SNPs, polymorphisms of the peroxidase enzyme, which will inhibit the function of glutathione. Um, glutathione as transferase is becoming increasingly familiar to everyone, and it turns out that's the primary, the one that the enzyme that has the highest activity of uh, introducing, conjugating, tying together the aflatoxin B1 with glutathione for the removal of aflatoxin. So glutathione is made of three amino acids, cysteine, glutamine, and glycine. It has a prominent sulfur group. Its construction is such that it acts like a platform along which these enzymes can interact with the glutathione and the, the active sulfur group is uh, making a hydrogen atom and uh, its electrons available to um, stop the formation and progression of uh, free radicals. Once it's oxidized, this should be a double bond. You've got then two glutathiones hooked together, the preferential thing for an oxidized uh, single glutathione to do is grab hold, hold hands with another glutathione, and this can be regenerated thanks to the function of an enzyme called glutathione reductase back into the active form of glutathione. So the peroxidase will allow glutathione to turn the hydroxyl radical or peroxide into harmless water. Um, I don't know if I put this in the slides, but the, I, I may have already, I can't remember if I left it in there or not, but the reaction, the formation of hydroxyl radical occurs in your ce each cell in your body some enormous number of times every day, like 50 million. I mean, it's almost beyond comprehension. So this, this system is working constantly in providing both the antioxidant function, and when it doesn't, then the glutathione is there itself, and it can become depleted when these systems don't work well. And the other thing to remember is that for GST to function, and there's loads of articles out there that use measurements of glutathione as transferase, um, and the same with peroxide, you need glutathione available to allow this enzyme to function because it's really just introducing glutathione to the toxin to facilitate its excretion. Um, the GSTs are named for Greek letters, and mu and pi are common ones, so it's GSTM and GSTP is how that got there. And the other intriguing thing is that the GSTs are found both in the cytosol, the mitochondria, and associated with membrane functions. So it's a really complex system that has evolved to help protect ourselves from these toxins. I refer to GST when I'm talking to my patients as the matchmaker. People can understand that more easily because you, I explain that if you've got the matchmaker there, it'll introduce the glutathione to the right toxin more quickly. Otherwise you need more encounters for that to happen, and to increase the chance of the encounter happening, I suggest they take the whole product, the product that will provide the whole molecule of glutathione, because then you can make a match more readily. Turns out all enzymes are matchmakers, but this particular function is easy to remember. 
So methylmercury is removed by both the GST M1s or T, and uh, combining with glutathione creates a mimic of GSSG, which is actively excreted out of cells. That's how cells regulate their ratio between GSH and GSSG. And then out to the blood, and then to the liver, and out through fecal excretion. And this basically is the same way that mycotoxins are excreted. And um, they will show up in the urine. I found a paper, and unfortunately, I can't find it again. I didn't <laughs> write down the reference. But I found a paper that shows if they gave these animals a big bolus of trichothecene, <laughs> they'd get a lot of trichothecene in the urine, where they didn't get it with just small exposures. So it's, it's intriguing to speculate that the test that we are looking at with the mycotoxin test becomes positive when there's a big burden of uh, these mycotoxins circulating in the body. Um, so again, we talked about the catalyzation of GST with mycotoxins. Um, in regard to aflatoxin, but here's an intriguing finding in a paper that shows that ochratoxin, abbreviated OTA, um, downregulates the formation of the GSTs. So we're starting to get a hint of how these problems can happen. You can get a load of mycotoxins and not only have uh, damage uh, from the reactive oxygen species, but it may start to downregulate the very things you need to defend yourself. And this was in renal cells. They also found that raising the glutathione levels, appeared to offer some protection. So we're getting more clues about how to protect ourselves. Um, so raising glutathione, in most studies they use NAC. That's cysteine, and it gets into the cells, and it's well known to raise glutathione. And I'll show you why this may fail at certain times, just when you need it. Um, we'll prevent the mycotoxin-induced increase of airway inflammation and hyperreactivity. I don't know if this is the same study that you presented, Dr. Holland, or one similar, but they showed that um, in animals that they could reduce the airway inflammation and hyperreactivity by restoring the glutathione in situations that are typical of Th2 type inflammation. One of the things that struck me when I first started reading about glutathione, and this is from a paper that was uh, written in 1998 was that the level of glutathione in cells known as the antigen-presenting cells, and these are actually another form of macrophage. They're also called dendritic cells. They're specialized macrophages which cart the toxin or whatever has come in off to the lymph node, that they will program the release of cytokines consistent with this so-called Th2 chronic inflammation response if they're low in glutathione. Now, the work that, uh, subsequent work that showed how this works, was done with uh, giving uh, macrophages in cell culture the equivalent of thimerosal, that's the preservative that's used in a lot of vaccines, at about the same concentration as a child would get in a vaccine. And they showed that they created this Th2 response, and then they showed that it was due to the depletion of glutathione. And then they showed that by increasing the glutathione in these cells, they could stop that chronic inflammation reaction. And please remember that in chronic inflammation, you're talking about your IgE-mediated inflammation, your IgGs, and it moves on into the autoimmune disease and that sort of thing. So the, the amount of glutathione that's av available uh, plays a big role in determining how our cells respond to things. In the lung, and I think this is about as pretty a picture as you can get, but <laughs> I get turned on by different things now than I used to. <laughs> the alve this is the alveolar surface, the alveolus in a lung. And these are macrophages. And after reading about this and reading about this, they used to, I found out that they used to think the lung was a privileged site. There was no inflammation there. And that's why we get along without you know, uh, having a lot of inflammation. But it turns out these macrophages roam around and pick up debris and play several functions here. And they are fed, their glutathione level is fed by glutathione that's present in the alveolar surface in the muco mucus there that's 140 times concentrated, more concentrated than the glutathione level in the adjacent arteries. So it's really quite an amazing unit. And when children with cystic fibrosis have problems, you can now understand why they get that because the protein that carries glutathione across their membranes is not working. So they're low in glutathione. They get all this mucus, and they get secondary infections. The reason you don't want inflammation here is when you think about it, these are very thin membranes that are allowing 
um, a gas to permeate through it. So if you had a lot of swelling there, you're going to be decreasing your O2. Oh, incident, yeah. <clears throat> so here's the adjacent uh, little uh, vessel. The other thing that uh, macrophages do inside the lungs and other places is they can engulf uh, neutrophils. So in this function, the engulfment of neutrophils that have spent, have done their job, is temporally, not, tempor not temporarily, but over time, temporal, correlated with the resolution of acute inflammation, <clears throat> meaning this is the way the lung modulates inflammation when you get a secondary response requiring PMNs. As it recuperates, these macrophages can come in and clean that up, and that stops the chronic inflammation reaction. So this is probably happening at small levels all the time, and this is known as efferocytosis, in case you ever run across that word. I mean, I don't know how they got that word, but... Uh, Macrophage is big eater. That makes sense to me. But efferocytosis, I don't know where that comes from. So efferocytosis is dependent on the glutathione level in the macrophage. Here we are, back to our diagram. Here's your um, mucus blanket. They've got some macrophages, some uh, eosinophils. Here's our blood vessel. It's got red blood cells. It's got some PMN sitting out here. They sit out here like the cavalry, just over the hillside. When, the macro when some debris comes in, Normally, the macrophage will pick it up and take care of it. As long as that debris doesn't deplete its glutathione, it's going to chew it up, eat it for lunch, or just cart it off. So um, things are fine. No inflammation. When it can't handle that debris or when you, it's picked up by an eosinophil that's programmed to respond, you get eos neutrophils charging over the hill and joining the fight. And this can lead to a big accumulation of PMNs like Dr. Holland talked about. In the meantime, our macrophages have become sluggish. I took this picture from a presentation I have on atherosclerosis where the same thing happens in the, uh, under the intima of the um, artery, the uh, endothelial layer. The macrophages become congested with uh, oxidants. In, in that case, it's oxidized LDL, and the same thing can happen in the lung. There's a paper talking about this. Um, oxidized LDLs, plain old LDLs become oxidized and becomes just another toxin and uh, creates free radicals. And normally the macrophage can handle it unless it eats too much of this. It can't stop eating this. Uh, there's no gate to stop it. And this gets into the macrophage role as a defender. I'll show you all these um, free radical generating materials that are released. They're designed to be released to kill invading organisms. So if you get a bacteria in here, and you release hydrogen peroxide and maybe hypochlorous acid, it's going to oxidize its flagella or its cell membrane, allowing the macrophage to engulf it. But if they've had too much, then they can't handle it. They're, they're not working. The PMNs come to work. So again, the efferocytosis is uh, critical for maintaining this normal environment inside the lung. The materials that are released are hydroxyl radicals. Um, the free radical from nitric oxide, you need nitric oxide to dilate your bronchial tubes, but if you uh, don't have enough glutathione around, that'll become oxidized. This actually combines with glutathione to create a material called GSNO that's a very stable uh, material that will have all the effects of nitric oxide, but if not, it becomes peroxynitrate. Here you've got a hit to your body, it's an O, and when you get peroxynitrite, that's an O, no. That's the easy way to remember that. So we're back to sp spending glutathione to maintain antioxidant stability. The, briefly, the CD36 uh, scavenger um, receptor is upregulated during when there's oxidants around. And this is what's engulfing oxidized LDL the same way I eat buttered popcorn. Put the bowl in front of me. I'll just keep eating until it's gone. The macrophage does the same thing. It collects all this oxidized LDL and becomes compromised and can't function. And first it can't uh, kill, and then, and then it can't phagocytose, and then it can't move, and so the whole thing just perpetuates, and you can see how this happens. Um, the foam cell has decreased glutathione. So if you can get glutathione into these macrophages adequately, you should be able to modulate the progression of things like, in the foam cells, the first uh, step in forming atherosclerosis, and these cells start to pile up underneath the uh, endothelial lining. Uh, there's, the, there's the origin of that, that uh, picture of a happy pig, but he's just sleeping here. He's so stuffed he can't move. The pileup, uh, due to other inflammation, and this 
what causes constriction and stenosis in arteries. And uh, the enzyme that's associated with getting glutathione into cells, it breaks down glutathione in the circulation called gamma glutamyl transferase. Um, and that's why plain glutathione is not absorbed well through the GI tract. Uh, is actually just recently I found an article that shows that in people with stenotic lesions in their coronary arteries, they have elevated levels of GGT, or at least there's a correlation. So if you start adding, this is available on a routine chemistry test, it's cheap. And if you see it, they used to think it was from other toxin exposures, but they're really now seeing that it's really an indicator of a need for glutathione. So there's a cheap way to at least screen for it. It's not a 100 percenter. But if it's elevated, you might start thinking about it. And all this came from one of the published studies um, using the liposomal glutathione that I've been working with. And this is published, and I'm happy to make it available to you. It's really a great article. It's a little dense, but once you get it, you'll understand atherosclerosis. Um, and then in the lung, phagocytosis of staph aureus is impaired with low glutathione, and the function is restored with a repletion of glutathione, just as we discussed before. So in my book, oxidation stress, depleted glutathione, and inflammation, they're not equal exactly, but when you have one, you're going to have the other. Too much oxidation stress, your macrophages aren't going to be able to control inflammation, when you have inflammation, it's going to deplete your glutathione. And then there's an article showing that this can happen in people that have a block in the enzyme called GCL, glutamyl cysteine ligase. I'll show you that in a minute. That results in a decreased production of glutathione. So where does your glutathione come from? In your macrophages and every cell in the body, you're making it starting with the methionine cycle, moving this methyl group around. You all know about the methyl tetrafolate blocks and the need for methyl B12 and that sort of thing. But the homocysteine, as long as this cycle is going around, it's not one of these things where you stop it and suddenly you'll get an overload of cysteine. It's got to keep going. It'll break off a cysteine to be used to make glutathione. And those two enzymes I just mentioned, GCL and GS, they put together the glutathione, um, the amino acids into glutathione. Now, and incidentally, um, you can get a block of this GS from mercury. So here's, a, you know, you could be, you know, partially having a problem with mercury and then get a big load of mycotoxin, and then you've got a problem. Um, so most of you are familiar with Jill James's work in regard to this, but I wanted to point out that if you don't have enough cysteine available, you're not going to make glutathione. Here's the enzyme GCL. It puts uh, glutamine and cysteine together, and then Glutathione synthase adds the glycine. You make reduced glutathione. All these, you know, people ask me all the time about taking the nutrients, and yes, of course they're important, and you should continue to do those. Uh, these are all the nutrients that are involved with the production of glutathione and the regeneration of glutathione with that glutathione reductase, which is dependent on uh, G6PD. And then here's the glutathione peroxidase, which needs selenium support. Don't overdose them, but make sure they're getting 100 to 200 micrograms a day. Um, the um, Pythagoras uh, had a G6PD uh, deficiency, and he got in trouble running through a fava bean field, and uh, this politics got him in trouble. He, um, a mob was chasing him, and he decided to, to run through the fava bean field rather than be torn apart by the mob because of his politics. Shows you how, you know, not, there's nothing new about politics and academics. I mean, Pythagoras was a mathematician. What's he doing being chased around by an angry mob? But uh, anyway, he was not able to um, use G6PD efficiently and uh, was not able to maintain an antioxidant function in his uh, red blood cells. Um, so we've got, oh, that's the fava bean story. Great. Um, so 4 million free radicals are formed per cell per day. So this system's getting used really often. Metals will inhibit that glutathione reductase. I just wanted to mention that for the show you how the combination of toxins can get together and cause problems. And they're the same old metals you always hear about, lead, mercury, copper, excess. Lead, as far as competitive inhibitors, lead, mercury, and cadmium. These are typical and familiar to people doing work with the metals. Glutathione reductase is inhibited by a number of things, including the viruses that um, Dr. Brewer mentioned earlier. And also, if you um, block glutathione, 
in this area and there's a chlamydia present, um, it will allow the persistence of the chlamydia. So it begins to show you how these things are interrelating between a variety of different uh, materials. So why do mycotoxins cause problems particularly? Well, it turns out in the formation of glutathione, we've looked at the mechanisms to make it, but what turns it on? That's where this NERF-2 comes in. This is uh, the oxidant thermostat inside the cell. And that's an easier way to say it rather than oxidant stat. But when you get an increased oxidation stress, this relationship between these proteins here uh, allows the release of NERF-2, which can then migrate to the nucleus, where it will stimulate a whole bunch of antioxidant um, response elements in the DNA to make glutathione, the GSTs, the peroxidase, catalase, and others. So this is a critical event that's happening all the time. Of course, we're going to focus on the glutathione. So oxidation stress releases NERF-2. If you don't need it, it's degraded. So it's being made and degraded constantly. It's held by that keep uh, mechanism. Turns on the GCL and GS to form glutathione. It turns out that if NERF-2 uh, function is blocked by severe oxidant stress, and in other words, it'll work until you just, it wears out. You know, it's like a bearing without enough oil. It wears out, it won't work, and all of a sudden, you're not, your uh, NERF-2 won't fit in the nucleus, just like the key is no longer fitting in the lock, and you won't make glutathione. So when these, this happens, these enzymes aren't working. NERF-2 uh, modification is what they call that. When it's altered, it won't fit, the key will no longer fit in the lock. It's been reported in severe asthma, COPD, neurodegenerative diseases. It happens in the brain also. So you're not able to make glutathione, which is well represented in the brain for brain function. And it's been shown to be present in uh, animals uh, related to age-related vascular disease. The, uh, this article by Fitzpatrick is, uh, Ann Fitzpatrick, is really critical in my understanding uh, NERF-2 modification. She showed that children with chronic asthma have problems because they can't make glutathione in their lungs, and the reason is they get this NERF-2 modification by the severe oxidation stress. And I think this is going to apply to not only children but also adults. Um, Dr. Hooper pronounced the name NERF-2 for me, so I don't have to do that again. Regulates the expression, the gene expression of GCL. So it's actually the genes that are not being made. Okay, we're moving one step back. It's not only being produced, the gene's not being produced. And this is important, which is key to the enzyme uh, in glutathione synthesis. Uh, it turns out that both trichothecene and ochratoxin will decrease the GCL and glutathione as transferase production in cell culture. So that's where the mycotoxins are causing, one area they're causing problems. They'll shut off the production of glutathione. Aflatoxin, which is removed by GST, as we talked about earlier, is also regulated by NERF-2. In other words, aflatoxin can do the same. Let's see if I can see where I am, time-wise. I'm pretty oriented to place, <laughs> but I have to watch myself on time. <laughs> The, uh, what was the other one? Oh, person. Yeah, I know who I am. Okay, so uh, <laughs> aflatoxin is regulated by this NERF-2 system also. And I'm probably going faster than I need to. Am I, are you keeping up with me here? So the trichothecenes are shown to interfere with NERF-2 in the brain also in a mouse study. And when you decrease glutathione in the brain, uh, you get, a, it's a, you know, the brain represents, I forget exactly how this goes, it's like 2% of the body weight, but it represents 20% of the oxygen utilization. It, so there's a huge amount of oxygen, meaning a huge amount of free radicals produced in the brain. So uh, this author, who wrote a nice paper on mycotoxins and human disease, a largely ignored global health issue. Um, is on to the issue, you know, maybe we pay attention to it more in the United States than some countries, but it's a problem worldwide, including the molds like Aspergillus, Penicillium, and Stachybotrys that we've talked about. Um, I am moving along. And uh, the uh, mold extracts 
uh, and the toxins have been shown to increase the allergic response, just exactly what we talked about earlier in this Th1, Th2 mechanism that's controlled by glutathione in the macrophages. <clears throat> so exposure to mycotoxins in the airway and the GI tract increased the allergic immune response in a murine asthma model. It was very similar to the paper that you presented. Is that the same one? I couldn't remember. <clears throat> but it's really fascinating to imagine that a mycotoxin that you breathe in might increase your res allergic response to something like egg. And maybe it'll increase it to other things. Maybe you're a little reactive to wheat, but you get a mycotoxin and you're going to increase that reactivity. And just it, it goes on and on and will help explain also why you see autoimmune diseases associated with the mycotoxins. <clears throat> So in this model, you got increased Th2 function. They decreased uh, interferon production. And we talked about the increased IgE to a, another material. And they, they showed that there were increased uh, isoprostane. That's a peroxidation product from uh, lipid membrane material in uh, naive mouse mice given uh, mycotoxins. Has a, so it has a direct oxidative effect in addition to this NERF2 function that we mentioned. Now, it's useful to know because we get this question all the time because there's an active sulfur molecule in glutathione. So we'll get questions from patients. And they'll say, I'm allergic to sulfa drugs. And it's easily, uh, easy to confuse. So it turns out that the, the big sulfa, the sulfamethoxazole, is actually a very large lipoprotein. Uh, that creates a immunogenic, allergenic effect, but it's enhanced if your glutathione is low. So the irony here is this reaction to the sulfa drug may be increased if you have a decreased availability of glutathione. So the answer to the patient is it's not the same. Glutathione is a natural material. It's the element sulfur. You're not gonna, it doesn't form allergic reactions. And in fact, there's data suggesting that if you have a sulfa allergy, you're going to be better off repleting your glutathione than being without it. And that'll save a lot of confusion and questions and awkward moments. <clears throat> so the lipid, um, liposomal glutathione is a hydrophobic. It's a lipid membrane that wants to hold water outside. And it holds the water-soluble glutathione inside. And this is in the reduced state, and they will also increase the absorption of these uh, lipid materials, kind of like fat particles. Here's a multilaminar uh, liposome. You can see little multi layers here in a freeze frame uh, electron micrograph. And here's the unilaminar liposome that uh, is primarily present in the liposomal glutathione that I've been working with. So it has a single layer on the outside and the glutathione contained on the inside. And here's a picture of it. You can see it's got a little corrugated fashion. Uh, and this has been specially treated uh, to maintain the liposome. It seems to make a more stable uh, liposome that's more miscible, meaning uh, spreads through water easily and maintains a very nice diffusion. And this lends itself really well to research because the researchers can take the pipette and 